So a couple months ago, I made a YouTube video about all the bad YouTube filmmaking advice that's going around and how maybe you shouldn't listen to it all. Well, that video is my best performing video ever. And what do you do when you've got a hit on your hands? you make a sequel. And here's hoping that this is more of a Godfather 2 type sequel than a Super Babies Baby Geniuses 2 type sequel. That other video I'm talking about was a listicle, and up until this point, I've actually been quite embarrassed that I only have one listicle. I'm sick of people making fun of me, one listicle Jesse, lone sticle, st So today, I will have a pair of listicles and you get to watch. The points in this video come from my personal experience as a commercial and narrative focused director. I'm just trying to cut through the tech distractions that people claim is important and balance it out with a little bit of my experience. So here's a list of don'ts, but I've paired each don't with a do. So do do the do's and don't do the don'ts or do do the don'ts. I don't really care. All I really care is that you just do do. When it comes to cameras, don't worry about raw. Camera companies are always trying to tell you that your camera is inferior and that you need more. More data, more image, more whatever. The answer is not always more. A naive way to think about it, and I'm guilty of this too, is that if I have all this dynamic range, if I shoot raw, if I've got all this information, I can make my image beautiful in post. And this kind of is just an excuse not to learn and not to put in the effort to craft your images on set. You can have all the dynamic range and image flexibility in post, but if what you're capturing is a flatly lit, boring turd, that's what you're gonna end up with in post. You can polish it all you want. You can throw as many LUTs on it as you want. It's still gonna be a turd. So what should you worry about? In my opinion, it's contrast. And I'm not talking about that slider literally labeled contrast in DaVinci Resolve or Premiere or whatever you're using. I'm talking about lighting contrast. Have you ever taken a photo with your phone and the image is just way better than it has any business being? That shot of a landscape just has the light at the perfect angle and intensity and it just makes the landscape sing? Or the photo of your lover in a French apartment with north facing windows? It's just gorgeous. Maybe it's skateboarders in a skate park in high noon and for some reason it just works. The shots just clicked. Sure, composition and all sorts of things, but contrast ratios play a huge part. Understanding contrast ratios are the beginning of a professional image. They take your shots from being happy accidents you can fill up a sizzle reel with into images that you understand they're repeatable, they're technically sound and professional. When a cinematographer starts a film or a TV show, they set a look with the director, but then the cinematographer in turn communicates that look to their lighting team and contrast ratios are an aspect of that. It allows the lighting team to know what the overall look of the show will be so that as they're moving through days quickly, the lighting team can already start from a way better starting point before the cinematographer even has a chance to look at the lighting. Even when I'm doing corporate videos, understanding contrast ratios lets all my subjects from different locations feel like they were shot by the same person. They feel in the same world and cohesive. With RAW, it's great to have all of that range, but a well-crafted image on a lower quality sensor will outshine a poorly lit RAW whatever image every single time. Start using tools that help you understand the light in your images better. Get a used light meter. Start figuring out false color if you have it. If you have a system that supports Ed Lockman's EL Zone system, get it today. That's what I use even for this talking head. It lets me dial in this highlight and this shadow. The EL Zone system is so powerful because it's linked to your camera sensor's actual dynamic range and can display it on your monitor in stops of light. Super powerful. The more decisions you can make in the moment on set, the better. I bet you a lot of cinematographers would bake their look right into the footage on set if they could get away with it. And one last thing, when I shoot a big commercial, we shoot on the Aerie Alexa, which is really great, super privileged. But most of the time, we are not shooting RAW. The only time we would ever really shoot RAW was on the Alexa Mini LF. 
because if you shot raw, you could shoot open gate, which gives you more headroom in your image and really helped with framing for things like social edits. So ironically, the only time I would shoot raw on an Alexa was for TikTok. That's irony. I'm pretty sure you can shoot ProRes for any sensor dimension now. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. So know what you want on set. Understand the sensor and the camera you have today rather than thinking that a new camera is gonna magically light your shots better. So I feel like I'm sort of the anti-tech YouTuber. I'm not, I do like tech, but I like the stuff that makes a meaningful difference to me. And this point kind of is at odds with the last point. If you ignore the previous point, it'll give you what my do is here in spades. And even though I hate the hyperbole of terms like game changer, this feature made a huge difference in my day-to-day -day video work. When I started this YouTube channel, I was shooting on a Sony a7R II. It shot 8-bit video, and if you pushed or color graded that footage in any way, it was like building a house of cards. You feel like if you sneeze, it's all gonna fall apart. And I was essentially running out the clock on that camera, waiting for Sony to release a 10-bit internal camera, and they, this camera I'm shooting this on right now. I don't wanna bore you with math, but in an 8-bit system, each pixel or photo site is able to create over 16 million colors and that sounds like a lot you know you have pixels next to each other and they get to choose from 16 million colors but it's wild how quickly that can fall apart a 10-bit system each pixel is capable of producing over a billion colors the gradations across your image can be literally exponentially more subtle and rich and one last note about this if you're still hung up on how important resolution is I have never delivered a 4K commercial to a client. My commercials for big brands that end up on TV, they're all delivered in 1080p. So there's that. All right, let's get out of tech specs for a minute. My next point is don't worry about more lights. That's a bit rich coming from me because if there's a piece of gear I'm gonna spend money on, it's gonna be lights. But sometimes the answer is less light, fewer lights. I remember doing a commercial a few years ago with a super talented DP. We didn't have a huge budget. We didn't have permits to shoot on the sidewalk, so we were sort of like hopping out of a van and getting a shot. But I was amazed at how beautiful he could make the images without any electricity, just using available light. And that doesn't mean that we shot these naturally lit. What he had is two six by six frames, one with white and one with black. So we had positive fill and we had some negative fill. And we lit the whole commercial like this and it looks beautiful. I could see how much shape and negative fill can add to an image passively. If you've ever worked with a shot of someone on a cloudy day and you try to increase the contrast through that contrast lighter, it ends up just looking muddy. There is no shape, there's no direction to the light. And even on a cloudy day, trying to add light or add highlight to someone, you still need a ton of firepower. What's way more powerful in a situation like this is taking light away, adding negative fill. You just gotta be careful because the wider your shot is, the bigger that negative fill needs to be and they can sort of become unwieldy and like a sail. But I use negative fill even on my channel. I have a big 40 inch flag right here sucking the light out of this side of my face. Here's a shot, for example, where I needed neg and I didn't have any. I just look kind of flat and top lit laying on a forest floor. So here I am today to say I am done being positive. It's all about being negative. Embrace the darkness. I remember when Apple released their new M1 Apple Silicon MacBooks. And one of the things I remember hearing is that, wow, you can edit 10-bit video with no lag on it. And I remember thinking, why, wh who, who is cutting 10-bit video anyways? I've been cutting video on a crappy old iMac up until that point, and I've been doing fine. Sure, it's a bit laggy when I'm color grading and stuff like that. And it's because I cut with proxies. I, don't, I just sort of assumed everyone cut with proxies. So if you do, I'm sorry, but a lot of people I talk to don't cut with proxies, and I think it's kind of wild. See, when I'm on a big commercial, there's this crew member on set who's called a DIT. They're the person that gets the cards from the camera, make sure they're backed up reliably, 
and then sends cards back to the camera to be cleared. But the other part of their job is often to make dailies, to basically take the camera raw footage, apply the cinematographer's LUT to it, and export some low-res, pro-res proxy files. So at the end of the shoot day, those files can go directly to the offline editor who cuts the story of whatever you're shooting. They don't care about the big juicy camera original files, they just want to get the footage and make the story work. There are lots of offline editors who have like super old computers. They're just happily cutting away on proxies on an outdated version of Premiere or Avid or whatever they're using. They make the story work. So I came up through that system and that proxy workflow is just a part of my personal workflow now. Even on this video I'm making right now, my camera is automatically making proxies. So when I copy my camera original footage, I copy proxies as well. I do a quick rename in the operating system to make sure they're happily renamed for Premiere. Put them in a folder alongside the original footage and reconnect it all at once. Once you have that system in place, it takes like 10 extra seconds. Sure, when I'm cutting 10-bit footage on my M2 MacBook, it's quick, it's pretty instantaneous, but there is a little bit of a lag, and it's almost like when you're talking on the phone to someone and there's an echo, and it throws you way off, you can't even talk. When I have proxies, I feel like I'm cutting real time. Forget about upgrading your computer, kick that can down the road as far as you can. If you need to color grade or do online edit, I understand that, but if you're only doing it occasionally, borrow someone else's computer, lean on someone else to help you with that part of a project. Invest in talent or an actor or something cool for a short film. Load up proxies, cut in real time, become one with your footage. Be the bits. Be. Oh, my contrast is getting all thrown off here. The sun's moving. This is taking too long to film. What do I do? We forge on ahead. We don't look back. So you turn on the YouTube, you start watching some filmmaking videos, and at a certain point, you start to think that YouTube thinks that cinematography and filmmaking are synonymous. That cinematography is filmmaking and that filmmaking is cinematography. But I'm not a cinematographer, I'm a director. My job is about keeping my head up and seeing the finish line and having a creative opinion on all aspects. Under the director is the camera department, which the cinematographer is the head of, but parallel to them are many other departments. If you think about the Oscars, think about every category. And yes, cinematography is hugely important and it's a really big aspect of filmmaking. Today, I just want to give a shout out to the art department. I think about Wes Anderson. Yes, he has a very clearly defined approach to camera movement, but when I think about a Wes Anderson film, I'm picturing his production design. Beautiful props, beautiful settings, every detail is so considered. Production design, sort of a broader way of saying art direction or art department, Production design is so important to every project I work on, no matter what its scale. Yes, I want things to be lit well and that sort of thing, but through the art direction of your images, you can elevate your work. I'm constantly thinking about how can I up the production value of whatever I'm working on? How can I get access to a cool bookstore, a vintage cottage, or get a horse on a beach in Magic Hour? If I need the right prop, I'll build up myself. I get obsessed with props on a lot of the productions I get on, or even my YouTube videos. The details in your shot matter and can make your film feel a lot bigger than it actually is. Even on corporate videos, I'm trying to make sure my frames are clean and clear and tell the story properly. I'm constantly getting rid of water bottles and wires. Every frame needs art direction whether you have an art director or you're the art director. Don't just worry about cinematography. Art direction is literally everything that's in your shot that's not a person. So things are changing fast here. The sun is moving, this is all blown out. What should we do? Should we fix it or should we forge on? I think we should forge on. We're just getting in the groove here. We set the look in the beginning. The key is to like make it look good in the beginning can all fall apart near the end of the video. But I can make up for it, and this point is the absolute secret to filmmaking. If there's anything I wanna promise is the absolute secret to filmmaking, it's this. And uh, it's like super boring, and it's a total letdown because 
I think deep down we all know what it is. So the don't is don't wing it. Do worry about prep. This feels like the part in the video where you kind of have to take your medicine. And I say it because I have to remind myself, prep. How boring. When you see a movie and the actor is so funny, when the shot is so perfect, when the light is so nice, all of that is because of prep. A film didn't just magically happen and come together. Nothing was by chance. Every stupid detail you see on screen was poured over before anyone ever got near a camera. So when I talk about prep, I talk about you doing your homework. So when you show up to set as a director, as a cinematographer, as a production designer, an art director, hair and makeup stylist, you've done your homework, you are ready to execute. But I wanna be spontaneous. I wanna be an artist. It just doesn't work that way. If you're a director, your job is literally to direct, to know what you want, to have a point of view, to have answers to the questions that are asked of you. And even before you've come to set, you've met with all your department heads, you've gone through your shot lists, you've shared your references through mood boards and storyboards. Everyone is on the same page. The shoot day is when the prep is executed. And don't get me wrong, it's okay to say I don't know a few times on set. I do it all the time. We're all on the same team and we solve problems live when they come up. But if you come to set without a point of view, saying I don't know a lot, or saying I don't know a lot with how you make decisions and with your body language, that's not gonna be really great for morale. David Fincher says every day on set is a rap Every day is a skirmish. And this is with him doing a lot of prep. And I've read about and spoken to people who have worked with the Coen brothers and they storyboard every detail in their film. When they get the set, they know what they're after. They shoot the boards as they say. My personal approach to prep is not that it kills spontaneity, but the exact opposite. If you know what you're hoping to and planning to achieve on the day, when you get to that day, you actually have room for spontaneity because you're executing, you have the team around you to help you elevate your ideas now that you're together. If you have no plan, if you have no approach to your shoot day, how do you know if any advice you get along the way is actually good? Don't wing it. Do figure it out in prep. The prep will set you free. So this last don't is don't listen to people like me. Do find your own path. Filmmaking is weird. It's kind of an art. It's kind of a science. It's super technical. Filmmaking is weird. And I've always looked and dug for articles for how like my heroes work. Everyone is looking for a repeatable template of how this trade, this craft works. David Fincher will run 99 takes of a scene. The Coen brothers will run two and move on. And the truth is they're both right. All the approaches are right. These directors are doing what they feel they need to do to express the images they have in their head. These directors are not perfect, they're particular. David Fincher is a particular director. Stanley Kubrick was an extremely particular director. He made decisions only Stanley Kubrick could make, and the sum of those decisions is what makes a Stanley Kubrick film a Stanley Kubrick film, if that makes any sense. Through all of the advice on the wider YouTube about filmmaking, looking for a repeatable template, looking up to what your heroes do, there is one variable that you need to account for. It's you and your particular approach and point of view. And the cool thing about any creative process is that you can achieve great things through a variety of different paths and approaches. Studying everyone I could while starting my own creative journey taught me one thing, and that's to stop sweating it and to just start doing. Because nobody can make a David Fincher film except for David Fincher. Nobody can make a Wes Anderson film except for him. And while it's important to look up to the greats, I think it's equally as important, or maybe more important, to just trust yourself and start building your own personal approach and process, you're the only person who's gonna be able to pull that off because you're never going to be able to pull someone else's off. Your personal approach, your point of view is your superpower. There's only one of those in the world and you have it. Whoa, so deep. So deep, Jesse. 
that's it. That's all I got. Those are all my points. My goal overall is to inspire you to think bigger about filmmaking. Don't sweat the technical details. If you're attaching your identity to a camera with certain specs, then all it takes is someone with a bit of cash to replace you. Having the tools and the gear is not an end. It's what you say with them. And it doesn't have to be meaningful. Everyone thinks that, well, you know, you gotta make this like super like heartbreaking documentary. Like, it can be anything. It can be the dumbest stuff, even if it's full of potty humor. Speaking of potty humor, I just want you to do-do.